I haven't told a lot of people about my first section hike on the Appalachian Trail for good reason. I learned a lot. I learned about trail etiquette, gear, and to always bring rain protection no matter what. The hike could have been a complete disaster if it hadn't sparked this obsession in me that still persists eight years later. I'll get into that story in just a little bit, but I did want to give you an update on the gear room here. We are still chugging along. Haven't made any progress since the last video. We're waiting on a carpet guy to fix something over here, and we have a couple outlets to change. Can't wait for the gear room to be done and for y'all to see it. All right, let's get right into that story. So it was 2014 and I was in college. A couple years prior to that, I watched a documentary about the Appalachian Trail. You guys probably know about this story, but I became absolutely fascinated with the idea of this long, long trail that went from Georgia to Maine. In 2014, I met my friend named Michaela in college, and she was also interested in backpacking, so we decided to plan a section hike together. Planned to do a section from Watauga Lake to Damascus. It was gonna be about 40 miles. We we're gonna do that in May. Her friend TJ from ROTC decided to come as well, so it's gonna be the three of us. So we had this plan and now I just needed some gear to backpack with. I had nothing. I couldn't just go out and buy some. I was a broke college student. So as any broke college student would do, I went back to my parents' house and rummaged through their old car camping gear and my brother's old boy scouting stuff. I did a lot of research on what it took, like how many calories it took to do a backpacking trip and also like water filtration. But that is where the research stopped because in a minute I'm going to tell you guys my gear and it was very inappropriate for me to bring some of these items that I did. So the first piece of gear I remember bringing with me was this huge old heavy burner that attached to those large green propane cylinders. You guys probably know what I'm talking about. It was clearly meant for car camping. So the next piece of gear that I found was my brother's old Boy Scouting pack, and this did not fit me, to say the least. So with packs, you have a hip belt, and some of you might know this, but for those that don't, a hip belt transfers about 80% of your pack weight to your hips and to your larger leg muscles that are a lot stronger than your shoulders. And with a hip belt that fits right above your hip bones, that's going to transfer a lot of that weight and it's going to be a lot easier to carry these large weights long distances during backpacking. This pack did not fit me at all. And I did not realize that you needed one that fit correctly. And just to give you an idea of the difference with me and my brother, he is, back then he was about 6'3", and very tall guy, and... I am not that. Uh, so the pack sat below my hip bones and all of the weight was completely and totally on my shoulders. I also had my parents' old car camping synthetic bag that I swear was like six pounds and it did not pack down whatsoever. I mean, it was like this the entire time and it just filled up pretty much the entire pack. When I figured out one day that your bag wasn't supposed to take up all the space in your, your pack, I was, Quite a surprise. I used my mom's old hiking boots and she's a size larger than me. And I thought like back then I was like, oh, any old hiking boot will do. And next I brought my hammock and I have never camped in a hammock before. I've never backpacked before. So the first time I was ever gonna hammock camp was going to be on my first ever backpacking trip. On top of that, I didn't even bring any rain protection. No tarp to go above the hammock, no nothing. I think I knew like, hey, I should probably do this, but I was just like, whatever, it's fine. It's gonna be okay, we're not gonna get rained on. I didn't even mind checking the weather because if I had checked the weather, I would have saw there was supposed to be a lot of rain in the forecast. I won't get ahead of myself here, but. So you can say this trip was shaping up to be a real disaster from the start, but something that isn't a disaster though is the sponsor of today's video being Element. 
I've learned a lot since this section hike in 2014. One thing I learned was the importance of drinking electrolytes while I'm backpacking, hiking, or running. During physical activity, like hiking, when you're sweating a lot, you can lose up to seven grams of sodium, which causes symptoms of electrolyte deficiency. Experiencing electrolyte deficiency during a hike is never fun, but Element can prevent those common symptoms of headaches, muscle cramps, fatigue, and sleepiness. One of the top reasons I love Element is because it isn't full of all those artificial flavors and sugars. It's just pure ingredients for proper performance and recovery. Element is a huge supporter of this channel and they are offering y'all eight free sample packets with any order. The flavors you're able to try in the eight packet sample are so good. My favorite is the lemon habanero and it's just got this little kick to it that I love. Get yours today at drink element.com forward slash Terratrex. This deal is only available through my link, which I will also include in the description below. Let's get right back into that story of my first ever disastrous section hike. Let's do it. So the day of our section hike finally arrived. We're all so excited. So we had a friend drop us off at US 321 near Watauga Lake. And we were so pumped. We took this picture right before leaving. You can see how absolutely excited we were. Within the first couple miles, we met our first backpacker. And he actually happened to be a through hiker and you know had seen hundreds of miles before him. So he was quite experienced but we didn't realize that we saw this older man with trekking poles and we didn't bring any trekking poles by the way as you can see in the picture there's no trekking poles not one in sight and i hate this now looking back but like we kind of made fun of him for it we we're like oh he's just an old guy who needs trekking poles like we named him gandalf and everything because gandalf has that that staff so that that was that was unfortunate. We would realize later on how necessary trekking poles were. I actually did a biomechanics study about two years after this section hike on the importance of trekking poles. So a couple things that stuck with me from that biomechanics study was that trekking poles are really helpful in that they essentially reduce the stress on your knees and your ankles. They stabilize you on uneven terrain, and they also essentially help lessen the fatigue on your legs. They also help with hiking efficiency, going uphill, downhill, or on flat ground. But at the time, we just saw an old guy with trekking poles, and we did not realize how absolutely necessary these things were. We made conservative goals for ourselves, which was great, but we made it to our first Place we were going to camp, which was a shelter after Watauga Lake, pretty early in the day. We felt good to continue on with the hike, but first we wanted to make ourselves dinner. We thought it was a good idea, though, to cook inside the shelter. It was a gorgeous day outside, and for some reason we were just like, and there was a picnic table there too, where people typically eat dinner or eat their meals or snacks. But we decided we wanted to cook inside the shelter, which typically is a no-go. Usually when it's like bad weather, that's like the only time that people would really cook inside the shelter. But you typically don't wanna cook inside shelters because that invites critters and bears possibly into the shelter space where people sleep. And so we started cooking our dinner inside the shelter. And there was through hikers like mulling about. Some were gonna stay there and they were just like hanging out. No one was set up inside the shelter quite yet. And there was a lot of people just kind of around that general area. And we were getting a lot of looks because of three reasons. One, because of that ginormous cook set I showed you guys. Number two was because we were cooking inside the shelter and we were getting all these food bits all inside this place people were gonna sleep. And number three, I had forgotten a utensil to eat with. So I was using this knife I had brought, this large knife, and here's a picture, but I was literally just eating with this knife, putting it right inside my mouth, which is very dangerous. <laughs> Oh goodness. Yeah, so we cooked inside the shelter. Not our best decision. So after we ensured that the shelter smelled like a delicious buffet for critters and bears that night, we left and started hiking until it got dark. And we completed about 15 miles and we're trying to find a camp because we were getting really tired at this point. 
and it was quickly getting dark and night was coming. So we decided to bushwhack to the top of this mountain to camp and that's really unfortunate looking back now because I try my best to adhere to leave no trace principles and I literally broke the first rule of leave no trace. I think it's the first rule, but it's travel and camp. I think it's the second rule actually, travel and camp on durable surfaces. But it was not the best place we could have camped because the wind whipped over that mountain so easily. And we soon realized once we got into our hammocks, it was going to be a long night. All three of us had hammocks, so all of our hammocks were just flapping, flapping, flapping in the wind. And it was so cold underneath. So essentially I got like maybe two to three hours of sleep that night. It was a terrible first night on trail. Something good that did come out of this first night on trail was this thought that has stuck with me through all of my backpacking trips. So sitting there not falling asleep and I was feeling a little afraid of any animals or bears in the area. And I caught this random thought and it was just like, I am part of nature. And I know this is cliche to say this, but I really did feel one with nature because before that, I guess I just thought like, oh, as soon as I step on trail or as soon as I like go to bed, I'm like being hunted by the bears and any animals in the area. Like I, everything's looking towards me. They're out to get me. And I know it's cliche, but I really did feel like I was one with nature. I felt like I belonged and I was just part of this entire system. And I didn't feel like I felt safe. I didn't feel like any bears were going to come after me in that moment. So that was a really interesting thought to have on my first night of backpacking. And it has stuck with me since. So after getting like no sleep that first night, we got up and started hiking again. And I remember feeling good like that first half of the day, like we were meeting through hikers, we were talking with them. I saw my first bear and it was like actually a mama and a baby bear. And it's the closest I've actually been to a bear. It was quite interesting that, you know, I've through hiked the Appalachian Trail and no time beats that, that first time I was backpacking. We saw wild turkeys and overall it was like a beautiful first half of the day. But I mean, I was, really getting tired and sore. I mean, my back hurt, my legs hurt so bad. My pack was still so heavy on my shoulders. And I think at that point we realized the genius of trekking poles. We're like, there's gotta be something to this. So we broke apart some branches and made some uh, trekking poles out of those. So that did help offload some of the uh, pain and pressure that we were feeling. We were so tired after the second day because we hadn't gotten any sleep. We hiked for two days. We weren't used to this, but I felt so ready to fall asleep that night. I was like, I'm going to sleep so well. There was some talk from some three hikers earlier in that day, like, oh, it's going to rain. We just didn't think anything about it though. We just, we were just like, whatever, it's not going to rain. It's fine. So we set up for that night and instantly like I am out. I am so tired. I just fall asleep immediately. It felt so good. But maybe not even an hour later, I just remember like light raindrops hitting my face, like very gentle raindrops. And I like woke up a little bit. I was like, nah, it's not going to rain. So I like tried to go back to sleep, hoping it was just like a couple raindrops and that was going to be it. So we all woke up when it was like still sort of like light raining. We're like, oh, what do we do? And at this point, kind of the rain was pooling in my hammock. So I was getting pretty wet. And then the sky opened up and the rain fell so hard and it got so cold and windy. And it just came out of nowhere. It was just like storming on us. None of us brought rain protection, not even a tarp. And we were just exposed to the elements and the temperature was dropping. So what ended up happening, I got in Michaela's hammock because I was getting super cold. So we tried to warm each other up with our body heat and she had this like personal poncho she got from ROTC that she tried to lay over us. And so we had some resemblance of rain protection that way, but it still wasn't enough. We were still getting rain inside the hammock, just pooling inside there. And then TJ was on his own, but he was hammocked under mine. So we had stacked him and he tried to make like tarp or rain protection with my hammock, but that didn't work either. We were all just up all night. We were so tired from the day before, so sore. 
and now the rain was just not letting up whatsoever. So around 5 a.m. we woke up and we we're like getting all of our stuff together and we were all pretty done with this hike. We were drenched, cold, so tired, so sore. At least I was, I was sore. I don't know about them, but I was very sore. And I think at that point we we're just like, whatever, we're abandoning this section hike. Let's get out of here. So the day before we had hiked past Tennessee 91. So we decided to hike back to Tennessee 91 and try to find a hitch into the town of Damascus. But it was like 6 a.m. at that point and nobody was awake. So we decided to just walk a random way down the road. We decided to go left, which actually was good because we were uh, going towards Shady Valley, Tennessee. And that's funny, <laughs> the name Shady Valley because that was a little shady. We got breakfast there and it was so good. The breakfast was amazing. One stoplight that had a general store. We just sat outside the breakfast place afterwards and like we're drying out all of our things. We felt like really good at that point but we were still done and we asked the lady there if she could give us a hitch to Damascus. So went to Damascus, uh, kind of hung out there and our friend picked us up from that town. That was the end of my first ever section hike. I mean, truly it was a disaster of a trip. I got zero sleep. I was so sore, so tired, completely drenched. I mean, didn't finish the hike and then left a trace and possibly killed somebody at a shelter because a bear smelled all of our food remnants inside the shelter. So on paper, you would say, that looks like a terrible time. You probably had a, a horrible time out there. I became absolutely stoked for backpacking after that section hike. I loved the feeling of freedom and having everything I needed to survive on my back. I fell in love with having a goal for every day and the only way to achieve it was through my own willpower to literally move forward. I learned that I was stronger than I thought I was. There was people that thought I couldn't do this section hike or I couldn't keep up. I liked the movement in my brain and that sounds weird, but was thinking independently from any influences, any outside influences. That first night, it just comes to me, I, I literally, this thought came to mind, like I am part of nature and I felt that. I really like contemplating that way. This story is a true testament that no one starts at the top. This was my first ever backpacking trip, a time before through hiking the Appalachian Trail, a time before through hiking the John Muir Trail and FKTs on the Mounds of Sea Trail and Ben McKay Trail. This is a time before the 100 milers and all this time on my feet on trails. But most importantly, this was a time before my backpacking and my camping failures. Looking back at these pictures and thinking of the stories, I have so many critiques for this beginner backpacker. Like, don't use your brother's huge pack buy your own boots, buy boots that fit well, bring rain protection for goodness sake. But I know these things because of experiences like this one. A constant stream of trowels and errors propelled me to equal amounts of success. So I leave y'all with this thought, allow yourself to be a beginner, start where you are, and don't let the fear of failure or criticism stop you from achieving your goals. If you're wavering back and forth not knowing if you should start a hobby or an adventure of some sorts, I say just go for it. You never know if you can do it until you try and there's no better time than the present. I just recommend you first learn some basic etiquette and leave no trace first. If you have a story about a bad section hike, a bad day on trail, uh, you know, a funny story, I encourage you guys to comment that below. I would love to read those. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. It only takes a click on y'all's end to help and encourage creators like me. As always, thank you for the support. If you did watch the end, please comment a bear emoji. This lets me know that you watched the end and I will say hello in the comments. Okay guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.